An ultimate goal of public speaking is persuasive speaking. This is where we put it all together. We have our goals. We've established ethos when we do an introduction speech. People know us, they like us, they trust us. We establish our research credentials and our ability to touch logos when we use an informative speech. We research, we study, we present evidence. And now we use those abilities and combine those with pathos to persuade people. So in order to persuade, we put all of these other elements of communication together. We have goals, communication goals. We do our research to be able to prove our point logically. We organize what we're going to say. We formulate language to help present our material in a way that is understandable and memorable. And then we hone our delivery so that we can make a compelling case utilizing all three of Aristotle's appeals, ethos, pathos, and logos. So when we, when we think of persuasive strategies, these are strategies that we don't only use in a public speaking setting. We're persuaded every day and we persuade every day. This is the stuff advertising is made of. Advertising is all about persuasion, persuading us to buy something to vote for someone or to donate our time for a particular cause. We are being persuaded through advertising. Now we also persuade people. It could be about something small, such as asking your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, what do you wanna to watch tonight? What movie do you wanna see? How does it usually work? We can give logical reasons, well, this one has higher ratings from the critics. This one has uh, so-and-so saw this and they loved it. Or we can use emotional appeals. Like, well, you know, <laughs> you pick the last one, I get to pick this one. And realistically, that's how it works and that kind of thing. But those are small things to persuade people about. Larger things, more important things, might be financial, for example. This is one that um, my wife and I have discussed. Do we want to pay for Xfinity where we get cable and internet? Look at that bill. Or do we want to switch to uh, AT&T? Not that anyone would. If we switch to AT&T, we can get their fast plan for $55 a month. We'd still have to pay for Netflix. We'd still have to pay for Amazon Prime. But we already have those things anyway. So is it worth having cable or do we just live with internet? And the answer is we just live with internet until football season and then we find a good deal on cable. You can always negotiate with the cable salespeople. We could also persuade about things that are more important. Here's another actual discussion that we've had. Public school for our kids or private school? All right, there's pros and cons for both. So we, we think about what those will be. Public school is free. Well, our taxes pay for it, but we don't have to pay tuition. That means we'll have more money for other things. It's two blocks up the street. Our kid could walk there every day. He'll be able to play with neighborhood kids who live here and go to the same school. The drawbacks from our perspective is that they don't have any faith component and they teach what we consider pop culture values rather than eternal values. So private school on the other hand, $700 a month. That's eh, kind of expensive. It's two car payments from our car payments. It's a 15 minute drive. His friends will live farther away. He's not just gonna be able to walk over to their house and play with them after school every day. They do have a faith-based curriculum, which we would consider teaching eternal values, but we'd have a whole lot less money for other things. So what do we decide? We have to weigh those things in the scales, weigh them in the balances and find out which one works best for us. The answer is we chose public school. And then after three days, we switched him to private school. There were 29 kids in his kindergarten class and the teacher actually wrote a number on their hand in marker so she could remember their numbers rather than their names. As we used to say in the 90s, that ish is wickety wickety whack. So he went to private school and there he stays to this day. So to effectively persuade people, we need to use all three of these appeals. Whether you're persuading a mass audience, class, 
television audience in an advertisement, or a close friend, a family member. You still need to effectively use all three of Aristotle's appeals, which Aristotle effectively explained and outlined more than 2,500 years ago. And science, neuroscience, is finding these things to be true based on how our brains work as well. So modern science is verifying empirically what Aristotle knew philosophically 2,500 years ago. But we need to use ethos, pathos, and logos in order to persuade people effectively. So what is logos? It's the way we organize our arguments and provide logical reasons for something. In most persuasion, we say, tell me three reasons why I should do this. Give me three reasons why I should switch from an iPhone to an Android. Give me three reasons why I should switch from Verizon to T-Mobile. Give me three reasons why I should do this instead of that. Give me three reasons why I should vote for this candidate instead of that candidate. Tell me why. And they better be good reasons. The other thing to realize when we're involved in persuasion is what? Think about this for yourself. People don't want to be persuaded. If they know you're trying to sell them something, what do they do? They clutch their wallet tightly. I do that. I hope you do that. We shouldn't just freely give our money or our opinions to somebody else just because they look nice. Think about this example that I use when we're meeting face to face. You get out of class and it's lunchtime and you're walking with a friend. Hey, where do you want to get lunch today? Do you want to go to the TDR or do you want to go to Cuzzo's? So Cuzzo's, if you haven't been there, is an absolutely amazing chicken and waffles place on Livernoy between Seven Mile and Eight Mile. Absolutely delicious food. All right. So who wouldn't want to go there? Well, there are reasons for it and there are reasons against it. The same with the TDR. TDR, what are three good things we can say about it? It's close. We don't have to drive. We don't have to park. And for people who live on campus, it's already paid for. I've got a meal plan and that's paid for. Those are three strong arguments in favor of TDR. Now, what about against it? The food, the food, and the food, right? Not much variety and probably not as good as Cuzzo's on a, uh, if you were inviting Gordon Ramsay to come and rate the TDR food, he'd probably say, no, I'm going to Cuzzo's, right? So what's a drawback for Cuzzo's? It takes a long time for them to bring you that food. I sat there for an hour one time and I had to leave so I could get back to my next class. But I walked out, I paid for my drink and left. No food. So that's a big drawback. The other drawback for people on campus, for students, is you do have to pay for it. It's going to cost you 15, 20 bucks, 12 to 12 to 20 bucks, depending on what you get. Um, and you might not have that. Plus, you have to drive. You have to park. You have to pay for parking and hope you don't get a ticket if you don't pay for it. So all those things are inconveniences. They can be a drawback to getting someone to go there. So to persuade, we have to effectively explain the pros and cons, and then we have to put it in a way that has an emotional appeal to your listeners or viewers, your audience. So what I always tell my students is we need to touch people's heads. That's your appeal to logos. And we have to touch their hearts, connect on an emotional level. That's your appeal to pathos. Now, when we do this, what are some emotional appeals? The abortion issue, one that's been around since before I was born, all right, and before you were born. So both sides use appeals to pathos in order to persuade people. Realistically, much of the time what they do is they reinforce people's existing beliefs about the issue. So these are both examples. I just grabbed them off Google. But this little, um, what appears to be a fetus in the womb, which looks like a little partially developed baby, mostly developed baby, sucking on his thumb, saying, choose me, please. 
with a question mark. I don't know why they have a question mark. That touches our hearts, doesn't it? Nobody would want to harm that little baby. Right? So it's an emotional appeal. It makes us feel for that uh, harmless, helpless little baby in the mama's belly. Okay, and now on the other side, Roe, which means Roe versus Wade, wasn't the beginning of women having abortions. It was the end of women dying from abortions. So you're putting an emotional appeal to women's health, all right, to the well-being of women. And so both of these appeal to our emotions. Like I said, they may not persuade, but they may be effective at reinforcing people's existing beliefs. And it's possible that they may plant a seed that does provide persuasion in a longer term, right? So we've talked about ethos, pathos, and logos before, but ethos is the competency or the perceived competency and the character and the goodwill of the speaker. So you have to come across as someone who is knowledgeable, someone who is respectable, someone who cares about the audience, and someone who's going to present findings that are beneficial to the audience. You're going to give me good reasons for doing what you're asking me to do, whatever that might be. So how do we develop this? What are some ways we can do this? We've all seen the stereotypical sleazy used car salesman, right? Somebody that just wants to take your money. Doesn't matter if the car is good or bad. They're just trying to get you in, get you to sign, and get you to buy the car. All right. And some salespeople have that reputation. Others don't. What's the difference? How can you spot a sleazy salesperson versus a reputable salesperson? It's something about their comportment, something about the way they present themselves, something about the way they interact with you, their communication skills, and their ability to overcome objections that you might have. When you're persuading, people have objections. I object to what you're saying because I don't want to be persuaded. So you try to come up with reasons to not be persuaded. And if you're trying to persuade, you have to overcome those objections. So ethos includes your likability, your attractiveness, charisma, your trustworthiness. This does not mean you have to be a supermodel. Some of the most effective, powerful speakers are ordinary, average people, normal people, all right? Now, you guys, on the other hand, are all attractive college students. You don't believe me? Walk into a Walmart someday and compare yourself to the other shoppers there. Ding. You are pulchritudinous. That's a big word that means attractive. But you don't have to be a beautiful person. You have to be an honest person, or at least come across as being an honest person. So that is ethos. That is how you convey a sense of trustworthiness to your audience. There's an old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you can convince your audience that you care about them, make them think that you're providing something valuable and important and true for them, then they're much more likely to believe you. They're much more likely to trust you.